Okay, so today we're talking about um, collective approaches um, to security. And the embodiment of that on the continent today is institutionalized as the African, Union, African Union's um, African Peace and Security Architecture. Um, and um, that includes the African Union, it includes the regional economic communities, such as the ECOWAS, um, such as the Economic Community of West African States, the um, Southern African Development Community. And just by way of introduction, um, it's a set of institutions, protocols, and reforms meant to prevent, manage, and resolve conflict. And we will kind of unpack that as we go on today. And this, importantly, um, enables the African Union, as well as the regional economic communities to um, intervene in cases of crimes against humanity, humanity war crimes, and, um, and genocide. Um, but I, I feel the need to provide just a little bit of, of history before we, we go on. Um, the notion of collective security um, is not new on the continent. In fact, this goes back to the early 1900s um, before independence when the idea of a pan-African army was presented as a way to break free from, um, from colonialism, um, to provide um, African states a means to, um, to be able to work together. It really um, sort of gained a foothold um, in the political discourse with Ghana's first president, Kwame Nkrumah, when he, um, um, when he broached the, the topic of the African, the Africa High Command. And um, that kind of required countries to give up some sovereignty, you know, in, a, in exchange for a more centralized um, political uh, system, con continental political system. And as you can imagine, um, the idea of giving up sovereignty is controversial. So that really kind of split, um, split the continent. Um, but we've kind of come full circle, I would argue, because um, the African Union and the regional economic communities really require a little bit of um, um, require a little bit of giving up um, some sovereignty. So it's it's not a new idea. Uh, it's been around and really rooted in um, how many early African leaders um, saw um, as a way to um, resolve common, uh, common problems. So um, with that, but bringing it back to sort of mo more uh, modern times, the um, I think I would anchor the way in which collective security is um, approached today in West Africa's conflict dynamics of the 1990s. And here I'm really talking about the Liberian um, Civil War. And um, that started with Charles Taylor as he crossed over from Cote d'Ivoire on Christmas Eve in 1989 with about 100 men. Um, by August of the following year, there were 225,000 refugees in Guinea, 150,000 refugees in Cote d'Ivoire, and 69,000 refugees in Sierra Leone, all from Liberia. And so that was a very concrete way in which conflict and its effects spilled over into the region. Um, help from the West was not forthcoming. The UN uh, was not uh, really responding. Um, the United States, which is where Liberia traditionally kind of looks to um, for help, uh, was also uh, not uh, really responding. And so that forced the economic community of West African states. I talked about this yesterday, this grouping of 15 states in West Africa, uh, which was really formed as a way to promote economic development, um, and regional integration, it forced them to take the decision that they were going to have to address this themselves. And um, what that uh, meant um, 
was that they deployed 3,000 mostly Nigerian troops because Nigeria is the um, big brother, if you, if you will, of the region um, into Liberia. And over the course of um, uh, the next seven years, ECOWAS, or as it became known as the ECOWAS Monitoring Group, or ECOMOG, um, deployed into Liberia as a peacekeeping, peace enforcement, kind of switched back and forth um, um, force to try to um, bring peace. And at one point, you would even argue it was part of the conflict. Um, three important things about that intervention. It was not impartial, um, definitely there are many times that ECOMOG was part of that conflict and they took sides. They did not have consent of the host nation. Liberia did not really want ECOMOG there. And it didn't use, it didn't pledge to use force in self-defense only. Um, it was very much a peace enforcement um, mission when, when the situation called for it. And these are all contrary to what the UN has. Um, the UN goes in, um, Claiming, claiming to be impartial, um, needing consent of the host nation, and pledging to use force only in self-defense. Um, and in fact, this type of, this pattern, where you see African um, forces go in um, without impartiality, um, more of a peace enforcement, and not necessarily with the consent of the host nation, has kind of repeated itself. And so, um, um, you might be able to characterize a lot of the missions by ECOWAS and the African Union in these, in these three ways. Okay. And one of the things that, um, so the fact that the international community was not forthcoming in Liberia in 1990, and then the Rwandan genocide, where the rest of the world um, really did nothing. Um, that really um, kind of forced the regional economic communities to take more control over their security. Um, it um, kind of, um, you know, made many economic community, many um, nations realize that you uh, can't really look to outsiders to solve your problems. Um, so what did that um, mean after ECOWAS? Um, after Liberia, ECOWAS sub subsequently went into Sierra Leone and also Guinea. So it was a whole conflict um, dynamic. Um, but then we saw that um, the, at the time, the Organization of African Unity, um, after ECOWAS went in to Liberia, they um, developed a conflict management mechanism. Um, and then all of the other regional economic communities here I have the um, East African, uh, East Africa community, ECAS, which is Central Africa, EGAD, which is the Horn of Africa, um, UMA, which is the Maghreb, and SADC, which is Southern <coughs> Africa. They all developed conflict management mechanisms. So all of Africa's main um, regional economic communities, which are meant to develop the, their regions economically, mm -hmm. Um, have come to understand that you can't have development without peace. And um, some of these are stronger than others. ECOWAS is more um, experienced and probably more organized than the other, um, than the other um, economic communities, but they all have some kind of provision that allows them to intervene when one of their member states um, is in, um, either in trouble or, or, um, or causing trouble. And um, this period of time, so from 1990 to 2013, the EAC in East Africa was the last one to actually develop this um, regional economic uh, conflict management mechanism. I think um, you can say sort of concretized um, African solutions to African problems. We saw that the Organization of African Unity then switched to become the African Union. And what was um, really um, important in that um, reform was um, uh, Article 4 of the Constitutive Act. And what does that say? That allows 
um, intervention in cases of genocide, crimes against humanity, and unconstitutional changes in power. That is unprecedented. The OAU, their predecessor, um, did not um, intervene in that way. There was one peacekeeping mission that the OAU um, deployed. That was in Chad in 1980. Um, Chad was undergoing one of, uh, a civil war, um, and it lasted six. The deployment lasted six months, and it failed due to logistics. Um, financial challenges, in fact, many of the same challenges that the um, African um, Union and the regional economic communities face today. But um, the rule was uh, with the OAU that they don't inter interfere in each other's um, problems. But the African Union um, has permitted, permitted that. Um, you also had something called the New um, Partnership for Africa's Development that was an, uh, an economic development platform and it was meant to essentially um, have African states outline their own priorities. And then you had the African peer review mechanism all within the span of about um, three years. And the peer review mechanism was a way to um, have African countries assess each other. Now, these are at various strengths and weaknesses, but my point is that in this particular three-year period from 2000 to about 2003, you saw some, I would argue, really important reforms with um, African institutions looking inward and trying to define for themselves what is meant by security, what's meant by development, um, what's meant by good governance, which um, all kind of lead us to, uh, to peace. So um, there are five pillars or five main parts of the um, African peace security architecture, or APSA. Um, the first is the, um, the Peace and Security Council, which is really modeled after the UN Security Council. Um, it is really the heart of um, the, the African Union. Um, and it's really what we hear about most when we um, think about the, the African Union. Just like the UN Security Council, it's a 15-member body, but unlike the UN Security Council, um, there are no veto holders. So whereas at the UN, you've got the, the permanent five, um, uh, Russia, China, the US, uh, the UK, and um, France, um, who can, which can veto um, in, at the AU, that is um, not the case. And the idea is that this Peace and Security Council is then replicated at the sub-regional level. So ECOWAS has something like the Peace and Security Council, the EAC, and so on. Um, and it's, it's been uneven, but you do have those, those structures there. The second um, pillar is something called the Continental Early, Early Warning System. That's, I think, um, self-evident what that means. But again, we see that um, structure also at the sub-regional um, levels, again, with varying stages of success. But the idea is what's at the continental level is also to be replicated at the, at the sub-regional level. Um, the third pillar is something called the Panel of the Wise. And this is meant to sort of, I would say, Africanize the, the African Union. Um, elders are um, revered in many African countries. And so the Panel of the Wise is really a grouping of um, elder um, statesmen and stateswomen um, that can be used to mediate, maybe um, kind of behind the scenes. Um, and um, they are, again, similar structures at the sub-regional level. Uh, the fourth thing is called the African Standby Force. And I think many might have already um, heard about this. Um, and this is, um, I would say, existing mostly on paper. Um, but it's, it's meant to um, get the regions to, um, to have, so the standby force is, is supposed to be about 25,000. And each of the five regions are supposed to commit 5,000 um, troops. And um, they are um, supposed to deploy in these, in these situations of either genocide or crimes against humanity. Um, and the idea is that they would, the African Union would go in, um, stabilize the situation, and then in some cases hand over 
to the UN. That hasn't always happened, but um, that's um, uh, one of the things that, that, we, that we see. Um, and then finally, it's the African, um, African Peace Fund. Um, and this is, um, I think, quite a, a weak part of, the, of APSA. Uh, right now, about 93% of all funding from the, for Afri the African Union comes from international donors. Um, I'll talk a little bit later about how um, just this year um, they've put together, uh, put forth a, a plan to fund more of their, of the, their programs. But the, you know, the argument is how can you have African solutions to African problems if you're not even funding your own problems, uh, funding your own solutions? Um, and it's hard to dictate where the money goes if you are not providing it. Um, so that is sort of the broad, uh, broad structure. So I want to talk about what has, you know, APSA, what does APSA look like in the 15 years since we've, we've had it? In fact, um, African states and regional economic, community, economic communities have been quite um, active. Um, there is something called the principle of subsidiarity, which is that um, if there's a conflict, the regional economic, commu economic community might respond first, then it might pass over to the African Union, and then it might pass over to the UN. Sometimes that happens, sometimes that, that um, doesn't happen. But initially, when there's a conflict or some type of tension, we see uh, a flurry of, of diplomatic activity. And I think that um, both at the continental and at the regional level, um, we, that has actually been quite, um, quite positive. Um, so this is kind of coming in in different orders. But the African Union has um, deployed into um, Burundi, um, not this particular conflict, but um, earlier on in um, 2002, I think. That was actually their first um, deployment. Um, the Central African Republic, um, Comoros, Darfur, Ethiopia, Eritrea, Mali, um, regionally to um, combat the LRA, Western Sahara, Somalia, and South Sudan. Um, and this is just since 2000. So with ECOWAS, um, I just have um, Cote d'Ivoire and Guinea, uh, Guinea-Bissau. ECAS, which is Central Africa, um, has um, deployed first into the Central African Republic and then handed over to um, the UN. Um, EGAD um, was one of the first to go into Sudan, Somalia, and then um, is uh, leading the mediation effort in South Sudan. And then um, this is not a regional economic community, but it's the Lake Chad Basin. And I bring that up because um, that is also an emerging pattern where we see, um, well, the Lake Chad Basin is a legitimate grouping, but um, it's not a, a regional economic community, but it has, de has um, put together a multinational joint task force to combat um, Boko Haram. Um, but, um, We've also seen individual countries act as lead um, nations um, going into South Sudan. For example, uh, was uh, Uganda. Um, and, um, and that brings up the issue of, you know, if you, um, what does that mean for um, sort of peacekeeping? Because the lead nation usually has the financial interests and maybe the political interest to intervene, but if they don't have that a similar interest, then perhaps a country that needs intervention um, does not um, does not get it. Um, we also see what many are calling partnership peacekeeping. So you know it's clear that the African Union and the RECs, the regional economic communities cannot on their own sustain a peacekeeping mission. Um, so we're seeing more of what many are calling um, uh, uh, partnership peacekeeping. Um, and what that has brought to the fore in recent years is the, you know, what's the relationship between the UN um, and the AU? 
um, one example to talk about is um, Somalia. So AMISOM, the African mission, African Union mission in Somalia, is um, the AU's biggest and most expensive um, mission. Um, but the UN has um, thus far refused to um, rehat it as a UN mission because there is no peace to keep, um, because there, um, uh, well, that's, that is the main reason um, that it's in there, because they would be acting not as peacekeepers, but as more as, as peace enforcement um, officers or peace enforcement mission. And that's not something that the UN um, is comfortable with. So AMISOM um, remains part of, um, part of the AU. But it's also an extraordinarily expensive mission. It, it costs about $1.2 billion um, dollars, uh, to run per year. The European Union, which has um, financed this mostly, um, had concerns about corruption, um, and so this year um, announced that it would be cutting funding to Amazon by 20%. And that was mostly, mostly cuts to um, salaries. Um, and that has, pr that really, you know, that was controversial. Kenya threatened to, um, to withdraw, but I think it also prompted many of um, the continent's leaders to think about, you know, what can we do not just to fund Amazon, but to fund um, um, to fund the AU's uh, missions um, more generally. Um, let me just go to what some of these um, challenges are, since I I have started to talk about the AU um, REC UN relations. I talked about Somalia, um, Mali in 20, 2012 had a had a coup. Um, ECOWAS um, deployed first with diplomatic mission, and then there was a power struggle, I would characterize it that way, between ECOWAS and the African Union as to who would lead, um, lead that. Um, and they took a long time to resolve how they would actually intervene in Mali, and that um, prompt, and Mali did not actually want that intervention. The region itself, ECOWAS, was divided on whether or not they should, they should intervene. The Malians called on the French to come in for support, and that was a, um, a point of great embarrassment um, for, the, for the African Union and, um, and ECOWAS. And that spurred discussion of something called the African capacity for the immediate response to crisis. Um, how can they, so the question was, how can African states respond quickly to crises? Um, because it took about a year for France to go in and to respond to Mali. Um, and in that whole time, um, the AU and ECOWAS were busy um, fighting each other over, you know, who, how to respond, who should take the lead. Um, and so the solution proposed by South Africa was um, what many call ACIRC, um, the, with the ACI, ACIRC acronym. Um, and this was supposed to be a force that would be kind of a coalition of the willing. It would intervene in about um, uh, 10 days or so, 10 to 15 days. Um, but the problem was, you know, if it's taken a whole year Bef you know, before the AU or ECOWAS could intervene in Mali, what has to change for that response time to be, you know, cut so drastically that you can respond um, so quickly? And ACERC was meant to respond in that short amount of time, um, stabilize um, the situation for about 30 days, so it would be a, a, a mission that was you know, didn't, wouldn't have um, the civilian components um, or the police, or was, wouldn't have the civilian components um, and would, could only be sustained for 30 days and then hand over um, to the African Union. But that really kind of um, also divided the continent because one, if it's a coalition of the willing, 
what is the coalition and why are they willing? Um, you know, are there countries that are um, going to attract more um, interest uh, than others? Um, what does that do for the um, African standby force? Uh, what does that mean? Um, and so now the AU has arrived at a, um, a position where they are, they've somehow incorporated ACERC into the African standby force. And honestly, it's not quite clear um, how that, those tasks are to be divided because there are you know, stakeholders in both um, ACERC and stakeholders in the African standby force. One key difference is that the African standby force would have to have approval um, with, from the Peace and Security Council, whereas um, ACERC could bypass all of that. So that makes um, people uncomfortable um, with that. Um, and I don't have this on here, but I did just want to um, briefly mention um, what is being discussed in terms of um, funding. Um, I, oh, African missions in total cost 1.2 billion. AMISOM is 900 million. So it's still quite a substantial amount of the AU's budget. Um, so a couple of uh, the, the ideas on the table are that um, the African Union would levy a um, in, uh, import, uh, uh, would impose an import levy, and that is hoping to raise about $65 million next year. So they want to do this in 2017, and then they want to raise that amount to 80, um, to 80 million per region. Um, by 2020. So key issues in that are how do you enforce it? How transparent is that process going to be? Who's going to manage the money? How do you, how do you get people to pay up? Because right now, um, there are really just a handful of countries that are regular contributors um, to, um, uh, to the AU. And now they're calling for everybody to, um, to contribute. So that's definitely um, uh, a challenge. I will I'll conclude there and mm -hmm. take your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Lorena. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you.